ETV, The State, The Greenville News, The Island Packet, The Beaufort Gazette, The Sun News of Myrtle Beach, The Herald of Rock Hill, and The Item of Sumter present ETV Debates. Tonight, Republican candidates for Superintendent of Education. And now, your moderator, Dean of USC's College of Mass Communications and Information Studies, Charles Bierbauer. Good evening and welcome to tonight's primary debate among the Republican candidates for State Superintendent of Education. Joining me tonight to question the candidates are Cassie Cope from the State Newspaper and Ron Barnett of the Greenville News. Candidates joining us tonight are Sally Atwater of Charleston, Sherry Few of Lugoff, Elizabeth Moffley of Awanda, Gary Burgess of Pendleton, Molly Spearman of Saluda, Don Jordan of Columbia, Amy Cofield of Lexington, and Mika Childs of West Columbia. Before we begin tonight, some ground rules. The candidates know this, that each will have one minute to respond to the question. If necessary, I will allow a 30-second rebuttal. We drew names when the candidates arrived for order in which we will start, and we will start with the first question to Sally Atwater. Let me ask you uh, first uh, a question that we asked the Democratic candidates last week in a system where, on the one hand, it seems the General Assembly is all-powerful, and on the other, local school boards fiercely and jealously guard their turf. What is the most important role for the superintendent of education to play, and what separates you from the rest of this crowd? Okay. I just came from the classroom. Three months ago, I went back after 30 years. I wanted to see, as a parent and as a teacher, where, where education was in South Carolina. I believe I can work with all people. I ran a presidential committee for disabilities for President Bush where I had to bring together people. I worked on the committee on education and workforce. And more than that, I've worked in many parts of the electoral process. So I appreciate all those elected officials from the school board to the General Assembly. And I want to make education a priority in South Carolina. Is for you. Well, the first priority for me will be to put an end to the Common Core standards. I have led the fight against the standards for the last year and a half, and we need to finish that job. And that will be up to the next superintendent of education as it has been put in the hands of the next superintendent to rewrite the standards. And we will need to rewrite the standards in a way that doesn't just repackage them and relabel them the way the South Carolina science standards were done last year under the Zace Childs administration. We need to be sure that we clearly rewrite the standards in a way that reflects South Carolina values and protects our American values. The Common Core standards were a classic example of the parents' voices being ignored in South Carolina. If I'm elected superintendent of education, for, for the first time in decades, parents will have a voice in the State Department of Education, and that's what sets me apart from the other <coughs> candidates. I have proven that I can lead and make a difference for the parents in South Carolina, and that's why I am different from the other candidates. Ms. Mosley. Charles, would you mind repeating the question? Well, the question is, um, in a situation where the General Assembly is, is extremely powerful, school boards are very territorial, what's the role of the superintendent of education? And as I asked, what, what separates you from the rest of this crowd? Well, for one, this is my third try to be the state superintendent of education because I feel very passionate about policies. And for me, it's not that we have bad education, we have bad policies, and that's what I'm trying to address. I am on a school board, which is the second largest school board in the state of South Carolina in Charleston County. Um, but we're very limited what we can do um, when it comes to student achievement, individual um, instructional quality and graduation rate based on federal and state mandates that are handed down to the local level for us to implement. So it is my plan to focus on graduation rates. Right now we have a one-size-fits-all high school diploma that all of our students are going to go to a four-year college when in fact we're ranked 48th in the country in our dropout rate. So we need to offer options for our students to be able to go on to a technical school, so a technical diploma, so you can ha go on to get an industry standard certification. Right now we just give you a certificate of completion if you do not complete the four-year diploma. Thank you. Mr. Burgess. 
Uh, Charles, excellent question. I would first like to thank ETV for having us here uh, tonight. It will take bold and daring leadership in order to move South Carolina forward for this generation of teachers and students. The thing that separates me from uh, the other candidates, uh, I have experience as an administrator uh, working with schools and turning lower performing schools uh, around. In fact, some schools that are on the worst 100 schools list in South Carolina are now Palmetto's finest schools and national blue ribbon models. Uh, it will take someone who understands how schools are ran. With my experience as a principal, superintendent, uh, I, I can do that. Additionally, I am an elected official in the Anderson County uh, Board of Education. Uh, if you want uh, something different, you have to have a bold, fresh voice. If we vote for Washington, Washington will continue to control education. If you vote for the status quo, we'll get what we have in Columbia. If you vote for a lobbyist, we'll continue to hear a louder and louder sucking sound out of our pocketbooks with our tax money. I will bring a fresh voice to that position. Thank you, Mr. Spearman. Thank you all, and thank you for watching tonight, and special thanks to ETV for sponsoring this forum for us. I believe that education is about the future of our children, and it's about the future of our great state of South Carolina. And the primary role for the state superintendent of education is to be a positive advocate for our children and for education system in our state. As a mother of two wonderful children who graduated public schools in Saluda County. I taught school for 18 years in districts across this state, some of the finest with resources, others without. As a legislator, I served on the Education Committee. As an employee at the State Department of Education, I work with folks in business communities across this state, and now for the last 10 years, I've been working with all the principals. I have worked at every level of education in this state. We have eight great candidates. But I think what sets me apart is my experience and the strong relationships that I've built with the people who have the answers. We're going to all have to work together to improve our education system, and I'm ready for that job. Thank you, Mr. Jordan. Students are the top priority, and I want to be able to work at both ends of the spectrum, and I have done that at the University of South Carolina where I teach. And I'm, I need to memorize all 400 state employees. I need to visit every single school district in the state of South Carolina to get a, get a whim of what's going on with funding. I want to work with what has started in uh, Kershaw County called the South Carolina JET, which is a consortium of uh, superintendent financial officers that are looking at a fair way to fund uh, South Carolina. I think tuition has to stop increasing in the state of South Carolina. If it doesn't, how are our students going to afford to go to college? When I, when I was coming along, I could work my way through college. Today, I cannot do that. As a matter of fact, if I graduated in 2014, I couldn't go to college. I, I uh, surveyed my calculus students, 100 of them, 60 of them are in serious debt. They're just juniors, $20,000 to $100,000 in debt. That that's has to stop. And so I have made inroads on that, and maybe later I'll have a chance to tell you what. Thank you, Ms. Kofi. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you for having us here tonight. I am the only candidate here tonight <coughs> with a background in education, a legal background, and a business background. The job of State Superintendent of Education needs these three qualities. I'm an advocate. I've spent 23 years being an advocate for my clients. I believe the State Superintendent of Education must be an advocate for our children and for what's right and wrong in our schools. I have a personal stake in what's going on in our schools. With two children presently enrolled in public schools, I have a passion for this job, not because it's a title or because I need a job or for political gain, but because I care what's happening to my own children in school. The job of state superintendent also involves business decisions such as funding, budgeting, etc. With my background in business, managing partner at my law firm, I have those business senses to make the reasonable decisions in that office. Thank you, Ms. Childs. You know, I'm a bit confused that one of my opponents decided to throw my name out there pretty early. But I will say this, despite the fact that her response had many things that are inaccurate and incorrect, she did get one thing right. The Zace administration should be followed by the Childs administration. And to that end, the thing that distinguishes me is the fact that I know personally the power of education to open doors that might otherwise be closed. I'm a product of public schools in our state. Those schools launched me to go off to Duke University largely on scholarship, and I'm proud of the things I've been able to do. I've been a teacher in our schools, public schools, 
taught sixth and seventh grade social studies. I served on Governor Mark Sanford's staff as an education policy advisor. I served on the Education Oversight Committee where I voted against the adoption of the Common Core State Standards. And I've served as a Deputy State Superintendent of Education. So there won't be a need for on-the-job training with this candidate. Another good thing, I understand fully the role of the State Superintendent as specified in our state constitution and also in state statute across a multitude of laws. I stand ready to serve our children. Thank you. Cassie Cope has the next question. Um, so as you all know, a bill requiring the review of the Common Core Education Standards is on its way to becoming law. Um, since that bill does not guarantee the full repeal of Common Core, which some of you have called for, what would you do as Superintendent of Education to address your concerns about Common Core? I will start with Ms. Few. Well, as I stated earlier, I led the fight against the Common Core Standards in South Carolina. And that's the reason I'm in this race, is because I see a lack of leadership in our state as I led the fight. It's, it's been terribly disturbing to me that the parents in South Carolina and the taxpayers and many teachers' voices were ignored. And it was a, a difficult challenge. It was a challenge that many said we would never accomplish. So the bill that was passed was a huge victory for South Carolina parents and taxpayers and many teachers that were afraid to speak up. But the bill only puts it in the hands of the next superintendent of education to finish the job. It is up to the next superintendent of education to assure that the rewrite of the standards <coughs> reflects South Carolina values. And as the next superintendent of education, I will assure that that happens. And I am the only candidate that really understands the failed philosophy behind the standards. And that's why I'm the one who will be sure that we don't end up like Indiana or Oklahoma or Arizona with Common Core under a different name. Thank you, Ms. Mufflin. I originally got involved in politics, um, having never run for public office in my life in 2006 because of the No Child Left Behind and the teach to the test and standards of learning, which were an inch deep and a mile wide. And so that actually the standards of learning has been something that's been on my platform every time I've run. And thankfully for the Common Core, people actually understand now what standards of learning are. Um, we didn't need to adopt it, it wasn't required, but thankfully it has been repealed and I do look forward to rewriting the standards and making sure that our standards are age, grade, and developmentally appropriate so our teachers can teach and our students can learn. Um, the Common Core, the only thing that was good about it, why the State Board adopted it, was it had less standards so you could have more breadth and less depth. And we can do that with our own standards because South Carolina has some of the highest standards in the country. So I look forward to rewriting the standards and um, with the State Board of Education and the EOC and getting those approved by the General Assembly. Mr. Burgess? Uh, Cass, as you know, Common Core is an outgrowth of something more insidious. It's called political uh, correctness. And as uh, we look at the school system in South Carolina, uh, it's broken because of that. We do not allow teachers to do their job. That's discipline and do their job uh, teaching. With the Common Core uh, standards, we have uh, some of the most rigorous standards prior to getting the Common Core standards in the nation. What I would do is call teachers together. They were ignored in this last round and ensure that those subject uh, area teachers and other professionals come together and rewrite the standards as well as include parents and what is uh, going on in the school system. Again, uh, Common Court uh, needs to be repealed. It has been uh, repealed. And I will make sure that we rewrite the standards to reflect South Carolina standards and to allow us to reflect South Carolina values. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Spearman. Well, I look forward to working on the rewrite of the standards. We need to bring in outstanding teachers from across our states. We need to communicate better with parents so they will understand. Um, I disagree with some of my colleagues here, though, that everything about the standards was wrong. Uh, there are some very good things. Suggested curriculum, I would, I would be sure that we keep in the suggested curriculum of reading Washington's farewell address or President Reagan's speech to the students at Moscow University. And I'd also be sure that we keep in the technical application. We're hearing from our business leaders that our students do not know how to take the facts that they know and put it into application to solve problems. So Cassie, I think that's one of the most important pieces of Common Core that we need to be sure that will be in our new South Carolina standards. That our students don't just spit back facts, but they do know how to problem solve. And they do know how to work together and to collaborate. All the jobs that Governor Haley has brought in, we need to prepare graduates for those new careers in South Carolina. Mr. Jordan. 
Cassie, thank you for this question. This is what sets me apart. The uh, standards need to be rewritten and Common Core has some good in it, as my colleague just mentioned. The South Carolina Council of Teachers of Math met in October in Greenville and it was all about Common Core. And I know that those are some good mathematicians. So there's some good in Common Core, but there's same things missing. I was with the uh, 80s when we did hands-on to write those standards, the 90s inquiry. I had nothing to do with Common Core, it sort of floated in on us. But what we need to do is we need to divide the state into eight regions and follow what Barbara Nielsen did when she was superintendent of education in the late 90s and uh, introduce computer science in the fourth grade. Listen to me, industry. If you don't, do, if you don't introduce it early, it's not going to be there at the, at the senior level. And measurement has to be taught right. Nanotechnology is jostling to be taught in life sciences in the seventh grade. And nanotechnology is 10 to the minus 7 to 10 to the minus 9 meters. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Cofield. Yes, sir. Cassie, my journey to this place began a year ago when my eighth grader came home from school and told me he didn't have to do homework anymore. When I asked him why, he said, because nobody's grading it, so nobody's doing it. In the next breath, he told me not to worry about a social studies test he had on Friday because they got do-overs on their tests. This was my first involvement with the Common Core standards and a grading policy that was implemented in our district to go with that. I led a protest against those standards in my district, not because I was paid to lead a protest against Common Core problems, but because I have a personal interest in that. As an attorney and the only one here with a legal background, I know how to fight legal and legally any federal intrusion into our state and into our schools, whether it's Common Core or other intrusive agenda. With my master's in education, I know how children learn and what standards are appropriate. Thank you, Ms. Johns. I'm proud that in 2010, you know, I was against Common Core before being against Common Core was so cool. I stood firm with parents, with our educators, with students, and voted against the adoption of the Common Core state standards. I remember what it felt like to receive all that pressure to go after those federal dollars, those incentives, to adopt a set of standards that may or may not have been right for the students of South Carolina. And we see all too well now that jumping at those federal incentives really weren't, wasn't the best choice for the students of our state. My commitment as the next state superintendent of education is to make sure that we write South Carolina standards for our children, South Carolina standards for South Carolina's children. We need to make sure that those standards are rigorous, and we need to make sure that the process involves experts across our state, involves our teachers, involves our parents and our business leaders. Because one thing I know, we don't need Washington, D.C. trying to direct what's happening in the classrooms in our state. Thank you. Ms. Atwater. Yes, Cassie, you know I am a special ed teacher. I was a special needs teacher and I knew that one set of standards did not fit all students. So when we rewrite our South Carolina standards, I want all students included, not excluded. I worked in Washington, D.C. and I saw that encroaching of their powers and I always fought that. As state superintendent, I want our parents involved with writing of our standards, as well as teachers, principals, community leaders, and I will fight for our South Carolina state standards. Thank you. Ron Barnett has the next question, which we'll start with Ms. Moffley. Ron? If you ask school boards around the state, most of them will tell you that the legislature should fully fund the uh, EFA-based student cost, which hasn't happened in, since before the recession. Many of them are looking at raising property taxes, they say because of state mandates and inadequate state funding. What's your position on EFA funding and is the state putting enough money in the K-12 through system? Um, I think the General Assembly, I mean, they're the ones that mandated what the funding formula would be and how much each student would receive and if they are going to mandate it, I think they should appropriately fund it. Raising taxes? No, I don't think so. I know Act 388 was an alternative how to equitably fund education in South Carolina, and that actually came out of Charleston. A lot of things come out of Charleston. Um, so that the state collected a one cent sales tax um, across the state to equitably fund education. I'm not really sure what they've done with that other than put it into the general fund for the General Assembly, and I, I would like to really know what has happened to that money. I don't think most of us do know. Um, 
but basically we probably are spending about $13,000 per student. And if we're looking for wasteful spending, if you only need 19 credits to go to a four-year college, I don't know why we require 24 credits to graduate from high school, which is about a $700 million cost for those five elective credits. And we're supposed to have seamless transition and be aligned to our higher education than we're not. Thank you, Mr. Burgess. Uh, Ron, as you know, during the uh, recession, that fund balances across the state and almost every school district increased. During that same uh, time, uh, test scores uh, increased uh, as, uh, as well. Uh, what I would propose is that uh, we look and see where money is being spent and repurpose our current tax dollars to make sure it's having the greatest impact in the classroom and on the student. We've had now preschool, uh, four-year-old for over a decade, uh, and after kids have been in school for five years, coming out of third grade, they still can't uh, read. Uh, that is a problem. Money will not fix that problem. The only thing that will fix that problem is to allow teachers to discipline students or control their classroom so that they can teach. Teachers across the state feel that they have absolutely no power uh, in the classroom, and if we give them the power they need, then they will teach. As one teacher said, uh, she's been in 40 years, and the last 10 years, teachers are in charge, kids rather, are in charge of the classroom. Let's put teachers back in charge. Ms. Spearman. Well, it would be nice to have more dollars in school districts, but the reality is the tax revenue is just not there. And I think as school leaders, and certainly as the state superintendent, we have to be very careful to target our dollars on programs that work. Um, the Education Finance Act was written back in the 1970s. Uh, it was written in a time when every little town, every community had a textile mill. And those days are long gone. And we've piecemealed the EFA for almost 50 years now. So as the next st state superintendent of education, I would love to lead the conversation in working on that new funding formula that's, more, that's simpler, that people can understand, that would direct and target those dollars to the programs that work. But again, I, I know that school boards, uh, it's a difficult issue to make it all come together, but so is it for our legislators who have so many demands of health care. So for, as educators, we have to make sure that we target our dollars on those programs that will improve student achievement. Mr. Jordan. Uh, we we got to fund by school district and not county. We've got to fund by population of students. And we've got to find funding that will, will give incentives to teachers to go into the poor districts of the state of South Carolina and teach the children there because they're very important. We, I am in touch with accountants that audit the uh, school districts. I'm going to bring them into the plan for funding for the state of South Carolina. As I mentioned in an earlier, I have working with uh, South Carolina JET, which is a consortium of financial officers at district level to uh, help rewrite the funding formula and also make it fair to all of South Carolina. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Caulfield. Yes. I believe there's been a disconnect between the Office of the State Superintendent and Legislature. I think the Legislature needs to be educated on what programs work and do not work and need to be funded. I have concerns with funding in the schools with a tendency to put the money towards administration and failing to get it down to the classroom where it needs to be. I also have some concern that nobody really has been addressing and that is high, of higher education in our state. 10 years ago, 60% of student funding came from legislature. That has decreased down to 20% and there are no taxes to make up for that. So what that does is put the liability on our families to provide higher tuition and tuition increases. So those are some issues that the legislature needs to look at for all our children. Ms. Childs. And the question of funding formulas really gets to something that's of deep concern for me. Often during this election cycle, you hear people talking about federal overreach coming from Washington, D.C. Well, I'm concerned about Columbia overreach coming from the Rutledge building. We need to make sure that as we're looking at things like funding formulas, that we're doing all we can to send money out to the front lines with a significant amount of flexibility so that those who are closest to children have the power to make the decisions that are in the interest, the best interest of our kids. As the next state superintendent of education, I will fight to protect the powers enumerated to our state by eliminating federal overreach. 
I believe education is a matter best addressed by states, particularly our local leaders. That's going to be our educators, our taxpayers, our business leaders, our parents, and yes, even our students. So rather than trying to micromanage things through a whole list of funding categories and programs that lead to growth in educational bureaucracies, let's send the money out through a funding formula that matches today's learning environment and empower our leaders to make good decisions for the children in our state. Is that water? Yes. I am not for raising taxes. As a single parent, I knew that every dollar counted. Once my husband died, I had to wipe the slate clean and see where I spent my money. So I am not for raising taxes. But I am for, um, Nikki Haley had an education reform initiative, what got me into the race. I read it, I thought I could support it because she called for a fairer education funding formula. All classrooms are not the same, and we want to elevate all these classrooms. It took me six months to get one computer for my children to use. Also, I believe that um, as a teacher, I need more than $250 for a materials fee a year. That's what I got. We need more accountability at the local school level and at the State Department of Education so we can get more monies back down to the classroom. Ms. Field? Well, I'm a solid believer that more money is not the solution for the problems in education. What we need to solve the problems in education is a voucher system in South Carolina. I plan as the next super, uh, superintendent of education to champion the school choice issue in South Carolina. We are a conservative state with conservative leadership, and there's no excuse for why we don't have a school choice system in South Carolina. And I don't just say let money follow the child, I say we need a voucher system in South Carolina. Once we institute a voucher system, what will happen is we will allow the free market to drive solutions in education instead of government-driven solutions. And what happens when you have that is you will have competition. And competition will give us a better product for a better price. So if we want to do better in education and we want to do it uh, for a less expensive cost, then a voucher system is the way to go for the solutions we need in South Carolina's education system. Thank you. I have a question that we're going to start with Mr. Burgess this time, working our way around here. Uh, it's, it's a question that relates to funding, but it's as much philosophical, I think, as fiscal. It's been about two decades that the state of South Carolina has struggled to some degree with the concept of what is an adequate level of education. The uh, General Assembly decided minimally adequate was a term that they could, that they could uh, work with. The state Supreme Court has heard cases twice now and has yet to come up with a, a resolution or a decision as to what is, is the situation in regard to providing an adequate education. So my question really for all of you is, what is your definition of adequate and what is the role of the state superintendent on this issue? I think the state superintendent has to be the voice for uh, children as far as getting the education. Adequate uh, would be uh, what I received my first four years in uh, school I went to an all-black school. In that school, the teachers could discipline and they could also teach. And I learned to read. My parents were not there uh, to read to me because they worked like dogs making a living for uh, my brothers and sisters uh, and I. Again, uh, if we allow teachers to do their job, give them rank in the classroom, they will be able to teach and make sure that all children are getting an education. Poverty uh, should not be an issue. Simply because you're poor should not mean you cannot learn. Uh, and we've told kids that you're poor, therefore you cannot learn. Uh, I uh, got a scholarship to Walford College, uh, went to Converse College, got a doctorate uh, from uh, USC. I grew up poor. Uh, we simply need to let teachers do their job. Ms. Spearman? Well, adequate to me means that every child in South Carolina has every chance every day, and that when they graduate high school that they're prepared for either college going to a technical college or straight into a career and for a successful life. That's really the dream of every parent, every grandparent. In fact, now it says the, the latest poll is that the top thing that folks around this world want is to have a good job. And we've got to do a better job in South Carolina and make sure that every graduate has that adequate education, the basic of reading, math, science, a love of the arts, whatever they're interested in, that they can engage in and be sure that they go through the full 12 years of school, 
finish and go on to a successful career or a successful life and become successful taxpayers in this state. Mr. Jordan. Adequate to me means accessibility and the opportunity to get an education. And right now there's two things that are, that are laying out there. One is the guidelines aren't written to have computer science established in the fourth grade with the literature there that will get the kids tickling their toes to be ready at the twelfth grade to fill the jobs that are currently going outsourced in South Carolina. That's adequate. Second, measurement needs to be thrown in there from K through 12 to teach the kids today that nanotechnology is here to stay and to, to provide the chemistry teacher when she goes in to teach chemistry the ability to just teach chemistry and not have to go back and teach a measurement system. And second, tuition has got to stop increasing because right now if, if it doubles again South Carolina in the next 10 years Who's going to get to go to college? So if you're going to have adequate and accessibility, you've got to stop tuition increases. Ms. Cofield? Yes, sir. A child is going, just like Common Core was a one-size-fits-all, every child is different and every child has different goals. Some children have goals just to graduate, some have goals to go to tech school, and some children have, have aspirations for college. We need to make sure that they are prepared for whatever their goal is. Just this week I met with um, a tech school president who told me our children are not prepared when they come to my school. On the same day I heard General Zay speak and propose that we eliminate Algebra 2 from the high school. While the current administration seeks to take things away and take demands away from our students, the colleges are saying our students aren't ready. We are going to have to hold those students accountable to get them ready for the next phase of their lives. Ms. Childs. You know, times I've heard people say that children will live up or down to whatever expectations you set for them. I think that that saying also applies to what we see happening at times in our educational system. Now, I'll be the first to commend our hardworking educators who are doing a fine job of educating many of our students. But we have too many kids that are leaving high school and finding that they don't have the skills that are necessary to be successful at entry-level work positions or even on a collegiate campus. I'll fight to make sure that every child who gets a high school diploma in South Carolina is prepared for work or college and for citizenship. And I believe that a key component of that is making sure that we individualize education. You see, I'm a proponent of school choice, a proponent of real educational freedom, so that we'll support the array of options that are available. And they may be traditional public schools, it may be apprenticeship programs, homeschooling, it might be charter schools, uh, it might even be a, a private school environment. We need to make sure that our parents have options and that money follows the child to whatever environment their parents choose. And as the next state superintendent, Thank I'll you. fight to individualize education. Thank you, Ms. Atwater. Well, I take offense to adequate education. All of our students need good education. I want to go back to Governor Nikki Haley's Education Reform Initiative, where she talks about having reading and reading coaches and reading teachers. Many of our students are not on grade level. Reading is critical to the education success of a child. Many times we pass on students that cannot read. By the time they get in fifth and sixth grade, they're discipline problems. I have a daughter that's doing a Teach for America program here in South Carolina, and I ask her, How, what is wrong with your students? What, are, what do you see as the greatest challenge? And she said, mom, it's their reading ability. They cannot read on grade level. Ms. Field? Well, I have to say that I agree with Sally as far as uh, I believe that students need access to excellent education, not adequate education. And I think that that will only happen once we finalize the job of ending Common Core. And you know, I have to take issue with some of the other candidates in their response to that question a few minutes ago, because I think the, based on the responses that I heard, they are not taking this issue seriously. Because if we don't stop Common Core, children, uh, a whole generation of children 
um, could actually seriously be damaged because of the problems related with Common Core. This is an extremely serious issue. This is the reason that I am in this race. And that is why it's extremely important that the voters understand that not just any candidate can be trusted to rewrite the standards. When I appoint the writing team to rewrite the standards, I will direct them to rewrite the standards in a way that will reflect the time-honored tradition of a classical education. A classical education is aligned with a child's developmental <coughs> learning stages, Thank and you. that's what will give children an excellent Thank education. You. Ms. Mosley. Um, it's really about getting back to the basics of reading, writing, and math. The fact that we're going to have to spend more money for literacy coaches in our elementary school, which actually we've done in Charleston County, is um, somewhat unfortunate that we have teachers that teach in K through third grade, and for whatever reason, they have not been qualified to teach literacy. So we've had to hire additional staff in order to overcome these reading issues that we have. And so I really think it goes back to higher education and ensuring that our institutions of higher learning are properly preparing, especially our K through third grade teachers, so that we're not in the situation where we're, we're having to reteach reading in third grade. Um, but I think, you know, everyone needs to know that school districts are usually the largest employers of any district. Uh, Charleston County, we're the fourth. We used to be the thir third largest employer, but Boeing beat us, and so we're now in fourth place. Thank you. The next, next question is from Ron Barnett, and we'll start with Ms. Spearman. Uh, the, <coughs> the, uh, this morning, Governor Haley held a ceremony to sign into law a, a bill designating the Colombian mammoth as the official state fossil. The idea of naming a state fossil, which was raised by an eight-year-old student, stirred debate on the teaching of evolution and alternative theories on the origin of life, with some lawmakers attempting to insert biblical passages into the bill. What's your view on the state's science standards regarding evolution? Can I go first? Well, I'm, I'm glad that students are involved and I think it's really it's a lot of fun for them. They learn a lot by bringing their ideas to the state legislature and seeing that through. As far as the state science standards, I believe that we have to teach accurate information to our students and that involves factual, factual text, factual information. As a Christian, I, I have taken the responsibility to teach my own children at home uh, about our special beliefs and uh, the creation of the world, and I think that is a responsibility of parents to do that uh, in their own home uh, on religious beliefs. But I believe as far as in the public school system, we need to give factual information to all of our students. Mr. Jordan? Uh, this issue of what you can't teach the, the Bible in, in South Carolina, which and you can't pray, is, is, is certainly a, 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 a law, and we can't do that. But <coughs> I find no difference between Genesis and you know evolution. And if you and if you listen to Hugh Ross, uh, Reason to Believe, you will know that the uh, 14 axioms that needed to be in place in order for this earth to exist are there in Genesis. And so I have no problem with that. As a matter of fact, I'm going to call on every school. You know, I, I'm just going to be the superintendent, but I will have some influence. And I am going to uh, going to ask every school to have a, a moment of silence. And I'm gonna ask every parent in the state of South Carolina, you can't pray in the school, but you can pray on the way to school with your children. And maybe you can't pray inside the school, but you can take the spirit into the school. I was raised in Camden, South Carolina by a very Christian family. And one of them dear to my heart is Rosalie Monterana. Thank you, Ms. Schofield. Yes, sir. As a strong Republican, and as the only candidate that has a background in education, law, business, and has children in the public school, I know how important it is to empower our parents with the ability to choose <coughs> a school that's right for their child. This is what we need for your question. Whether or not a parent feels like the teachings in a public school are necessary for their child, a private school, a charter school, that empowers our parents to make that decision on what is best for their children. Not only that, but with my business background, 
I feel that competition is imperative. Competition among educators, among our schools, will only breed more success. Ms. Charles? I believe that the approach the state took in 2005 in addressing this issue is one that, that should hold in the finalization of the standards that are being considered right now and what it will allow us for, teacher, for kids to be taught to critically analyze information. And I think it's important that they be able to, to do that as we're looking at matters such as uh, the theory of evolution and creationism. But it does get us to the heart of what we're struggling with in education. We need to promote individualizing education by investing real educational freedom so that our parents can choose how and where their child is educated. And we will empower our parents with real school choice when we allow money to follow the child to the learning environment <coughs> that their parents choose. And we do that through things like vouchers, tax credits, tax deductions, scholarships, grants. There's a whole array of funding mechanisms that will allow parents to make decisions, especially as it relates to something as, as powerful as deciding how things like evolution will be taught in our schools. So I think it's important that we reinforce what's taught in our classrooms with strong standards, but we also need to strengthen the options that our parents have. Thank you. Is that one? Yes. I support the state science standards, but as a woman of faith, I have always needed my faith. I lost my husband at a young age. He was 40 years old, and I raised my three girls as a single parent, and I needed the Lord by my side many times. Uh, as a teacher, we do ask that moment of silence, and I know this, as long as we have tests Many students are going to need the, to say that moment of silence and prayer before they take a test. Ms. Few. Well, I do not support the South Carolina science standards that were adopted last year. And in fact, the South Carolina science standards that were adopted last year are a disguised set of common core next generation science standards that were pushed through illegally through our current administration. And that would be Dr. Zace through actually Sharmika Childs uh, particularly. And in, in regard to the evolution issue, I have to say that that is one of the problems with our education system today. And it's one of the problems that has been brought to light through the problems with the Common Core uh, Standards is that children are not receiving an objective education. There is plenty of science and research behind the theory of intelligent design, but, and yet it is not allowed in the classroom. There is no reason why the theory, the scientific theory of intelligent design should not be taught in the classroom alongside the theory of evolution. And that way children would receive an objective education and they could also, for Christian children, could point to their God through the theory of intelligent design. Thank you. Children need to have an objective education in the public school classroom. Thank you, Ms. Charles. I'm going to give you 30 seconds for rebuttal. Well, yes, and I think it's important to always make sure that the, the record's clear, that the record is straight. Uh, our state has not adopted the next generation science standards, and saying it over and over again simply is not going to make that true. In fact, I think it probably will be more appropriate if we focus our efforts on addressing the fact that, you know, we're all conservatives up here, some of us far less than others. Rather than targeting individuals who may have similar views, let's target our efforts on making sure that we don't, as Republicans, <coughs> inadvertently send up a nomination who doesn't actually hold true to conservative principles, but sitting here and misrepresenting the reality of the actions that I've taken or even the actions that General Zace has taken simply is not going to put us in a strong position as a party. Thank you. Ms. Moffley, we'll continue with you. I'm a firm believer in separation of church and state. Um, I do, there is a law that districts could adopt giving outside credit for religion. If, I think we need to take that one step further and get the State Board of Education to write a regulation to allow that credit for outside credit. I mean, there was a giant lawsuit in Spartanburg over this that was quite interesting if you'd like to look that up. But as a business owner, I would just like to clear this up. I've run three small businesses for the last 26 years. I do have four children who all went through public schools. And having four children, I'm really the only candidate up here that has tried all those choices that you're hearing. <laughs> Traditional, public, Montessori, charter, religious, Baptist, Catholic, private. I'm homeschooled. So I actually understand choice and also, in, um, I was, it was my idea to implement the Office of School Choice at the State Department of Education, which they did do, and at the moment they've renamed it the Office of Transformation, 
but I am all for choice as well. Mr. Burgess. You know, Ron, great question. As a, a, a Christian, uh, I find it interesting that uh, we see a difference uh, between uh, Genesis and uh, the theory of, of evolution. If you look at the book of Genesis, uh, things start with the simple and with uh, the uh, complex. Uh, and we need to teach evolution as a theory, not a conclusive fact. If one were to find a watch in the middle of the desert, I don't think anyone would assume that it uh, evolved. Uh, kids uh, have the right to pray in school. Uh, they meet each other at the pole. Uh, we have release time for, uh, for young people. Uh, but we need to make sure that children are given all of the information. But uh, it is the home's responsibility and houses of faith responsibility uh, to teach faith. I do not to base my faith on science, nor do I base my science on faith, but my faith verifies my science. Cassie Cope has the next question for Mr. Jordan. Um, so the State Department of Education is in the process of rolling out a new teacher and educator evaluation system that considers in part how well students perform year to year. How much should educator evaluations be tied to student performance and what should, would you do as State Superintendent of Education to retain and attract quality teachers to South Carolina schools? Cassie, thank you. Uh, I work with teachers all over the state through organizations like the South Carolina Academy of Science, the South Carolina Council of Teachers of Math, and the South Carolina Science Council. I speak at all of those. I'm well aware and connected to the teachers. And I have already started, Cassie, a, a uh, draft of how to evaluate teachers in the state of South Carolina. And it goes like this. First of all, they've got to be in involved in the actual uh, writing the guidelines. The teacher has to be involved in that. They're the ones going to be evaluated. Second, they have to be on the committee that does the evaluation and it has to be a three-year turnover. Third, you don't, you don't grade a teacher A, B, C, and D. They're professionals. I don't want to be a B-plus professor, and I know no lawyer wants to be a C-plus lawyer. And also, you don't tie evaluations to student test scores. And there must be a method for appeal at the local school level and at the district level to avoid litigation. I've surfaced this all through by, by the teachers I know in South Carolina, and I'm getting good rapport back, and we'll continue to develop it. Ms. Cofield. Cassie, as a former teacher, I have um, great concern regarding the evaluations that we are using. Evaluations have been an issue since I was teaching school 25 years ago, and we are still struggling with that today, which is disappointing. Our goal, of course, is to recruit and retain the best teachers in South Carolina. What's happening now is our teachers are being told what to teach, when to teach, how to teach, and then they're being told how to evaluate it. We have removed from the teachers their power <coughs> to understand individual learning and to use creativity to teach our children. Through a fair and balanced evaluation, teacher Teacher performance can be evaluated from many factors, from peer evaluation, administration evaluation, student, parents, um, anything that the community would choose to evaluate a teacher on its quality. Thank you, Ms. Child. I think it's important that we make sure we have an evaluation system, and that's fair, on one that our educators understand, and also one that does incorporate the, the use of student performance data, particularly growth, in a way that's fair, in a way that's objective. Uh, but all of that, you know, it really is not going to lead to transformational changes in our education system unless we truly empower our parents with real school choice. I mean, until parents are fully in control of what's happening in the education system, what we're going to find is that we keep from a centralized command structure trying to bring about changes that don't really lead to significant results. No, more what I think is most important is that we make sure our kids are matched to the learning environment that will best meet their children, best meet their needs, rather than <coughs> focusing so much on whether or not this evaluation system works over that evaluation system. Ms. Atwater? As a teacher, I've been going around the state when I announced my candidacy for state superintendent. I ask them about teacher evaluations. They don't like the letter grades. They feel they're in a profession. They don't like A, B, C, D, and F. 
Teachers also want to evaluate their principals and administration. They want a two-way process. <clears throat> but as a special ed teacher, I'm not sure I like the growth part, student growth, because I never know how my students are going to perform. So I do think that there are many issues still that need to be considered in our teacher evaluation. Regarding quality teachers, we need more quality teachers. I think teachers need a pay raise. If you're gonna attract the best and the brightest, South Carolina's gonna have to pay more. Ladies and gentlemen, I got to school every day at 6.30 and- Thank you. <laughs> Ms. Field. Well, first of all, I don't believe that teacher evaluations should be tied to standardized tests, uh, particularly the tests that will be aligned with the Common Core Standards because the Common Core Standards, the children will not do well um, on any test that evaluates those standards. Obviously, it would not be fair to tie a teacher's performance to those faulty standards. In addition to that, I think that what has happened in public school classrooms is that the whole focus has become about the test. Teachers are teaching to test instead of teaching to children, and that has really hurt the entire education system. So I'm particularly <coughs> opposed to standardized tests in general, and especially the federal ties to standardized tests, which most people don't understand has been a federal um, in impediment for South Carolina for decades now. We are tied to federal standardized tests through the Title I funds, and it goes back to Republican leadership on the federal level. And it's time for us to stop allowing the federal government to control what's happened in South Carolina classrooms. Thank you, Ms. Moffley. I don't agree with using student performance for teacher evaluation. Charleston County, we actually got more money than the state. We got $24 million to study, we call it the bridge program, uh, how to do teacher evaluations, including student performance and then pay for performance and value added measures. And actually, nobody's happy in Charleston County. This is not gonna work. Common Core is gone. The Smarter Balance has been, re has been pushed out the door. We're going to be looking at a different test for accountability, and I would be suggesting as part of that committee that we would look at the Iowa for our um, request for proposals that the State Budget and Control Board will be doing. But I've sat on many a teacher appeal hearing, and our ADEPT, our evaluation that we had presently in the state was was um, adequate. It did an adequate job. I'm, I'm actually a very much of an adept expert at this point from the hearings that I've sat on. Um, but to recruit, retain, and attract our best and brightest, I think we need to treat our teachers like professionals and pay them the national average. Mr. Burgess. I don't buy the no. premise that evaluating teachers will make schools better. Teachers are not the problem. The system is uh, broken and we need to change uh, the system uh, itself. Value added or adding test scores in is a federal mandate so that we could participate and race to the top. I don't think anyone in South Carolina would want uh, Ernie Duncan type Chicago schools here. They're not a great model. But I will say this as a practicing administrator, give me teachers anywhere in the state, adequate number, regardless of where they were educated, regardless of their evaluation, give me the worst school in South Carolina, keep the federal government out of my business, the state government out of my business, and the district office out of my business, and we'll turn that school around in two to three years. We have the best and the brightest now. They're leaving because they have no control in their classrooms. Thank you. Ms. Spearman. Well, first of all, Cassie, I, I believe teaching is um, very high calling, and it is an honorable profession, and we have to elevate our teachers and support them. I know when I was a teacher, I wanted to get better, and I believe our teachers in South Carolina want to be evaluated, and they want to get good information from that evaluation. But evaluation models should be fair, give good information, and be like a flashlight, not a hammer. And I adamantly oppose what the current administration pushed last year across the state, that our teachers would be evaluated on an A to F model. One of the brightest businessmen in the state said that he would never treat his professionals that way, and we're not gonna do that to our teachers if I'm state superintendent of education. I do believe that if we look at student progress as part of that evaluation, that we have to have multiple measures, not just one high stakes test. We've got to reel that back in. We went way too far with the impact of high stakes testing that's running people away from teaching. But we've got to continue to focus on the strengths and weaknesses to give information for teachers so they can improve. Thank you. We have about three minutes left for this, this evening. 
there are a lot of you here, so that's what's, <laughs> what's taken so, uh, so much time. But thank you for all your answers. Let me ask you a, a quick question that you'll each have about 20 seconds to answer. If you can do it in a tweet, that's about the right amount. Of, <laughs> of, of. Uh, in the past year, we've seen consolidation in the state government, uh, adding some, some things to the governor's office. Uh, the state superintendent of education is an elected office, obviously. The question would be, should it remain that or should it be an appointed office within the governor's purview? And we'll start with Ms. Cofield. 20 seconds, tweet length. I believe it should remain an elected office. Um, I believe that the people should decide who, who is leading their, their children in our schools. Well done, Ms. Giles. I believe it should be an appointed position uh, in par as part of the governor's cabinet. Uh, and I believe that uh, we need to make sure that we're putting people in place who are going to fight to ensure that we have local control of our schools and that we are promoting educational freedom for our parents. Is that one? I'm running because I want to make education a priority and of interest in, our South, in South Carolina. I want to step back and say I'll let you know when I'm superintendent of education if it should be elected or appointed. <laughs> Ms. Few. I believe that it should remain an elected position because it is such an important issue for South Carolina. It should have direct accountability to the parents and taxpayers of South Carolina. Nearly half the state budget goes to education. Taxpayers need that accountability. And I find it interesting that any candidate that's running th would, should think that it should be an appointed position. I think that's a great farce. Ms. Moffley. Seeing that we, we fight wars for democracy to allow other countries to have the right to a vote for their elected officials to take away our right, I would disagree. I think it should be elected, that we should elect our own officials to represent us. Mr. Burgess? I believe in we, uh, the people, uh, that the people should have a right to vote for their superintendent of education, particularly because over two-thirds of the budget in the state is about education and taxpayers need to have a voice in that particular process. Mr. Spearman? Well, currently our state constitution, the only requirement to be state superintendent of education is that you're 18 years old and a registered voter. I think we need to set some standards for superintendent of education that would include a high school, college degree and experience in education. I personally think it should be appointed but the real question has to go to the people. I believe the General Assembly should put it on a referendum and let the people of South Carolina decide. Mr. Jordan. If I was appointed, you think I could work to stop tuition increases in the state of South Carolina? I doubt it. You wouldn't be listening to these eight candidates today. And we wouldn't be learning from these exposures in these forums. I'm willing, I, I like the current setup that the superintendent has to work with the uh, school boards, the uh, uh, legislature and the oversight committee. It's a wonderful system. Thank you. You were all very concise and I appreciate that. It means I don't have to rush through the closing <laughs> credits here. I want to thank all of our candidates, all eight of them, for being here with us this evening. And thanks, of course, to Cassie Cope and to Ron Barnett. For more information on all the upcoming ETV debates, visit SCETV.org. Now, for everyone at ETV, I'm Charles Bierbauer. Thanks for being with us and good night.